It is June 1967. The place is the South China Sea near the coast of Vietnam. The USS Harnett County has sailed 10,000 miles from the western shore of the United States and has arrived at the Cochin River in the Mekong Delta. The war that lies ahead for these men will be on the rivers and rice paddies of this ancient land. For the next 12 months, they will launch patrol boats and armed helicopters against the enemy. They will search from the skies and patrol a thousand miles of waterways to fight the Viet Cong. This is their story. It begins here on the land, amid the lace-like structure of canal and waterway. This is the heartland of South Vietnam, the Mekong Delta. Here, where the mangrove forests stretch as far as the eye can see, where lush farms and rice paddies dot the land, the Viet Cong exercise a shadow tyranny over the people, using the age-old tactics of force and terror. Zero four four Ironhead. Two, are you coming in at this time? Over. Give me a green deck, and I'm on my way. Ah, uh, yeah, Ironhead. Two, Roger. Green deck. Wind zero three five four nine knots. Over. Zero four four. I'm on my way in. Ironhead. Two, Roger. Out. These men, and others like them, have come here to aid this small nation caught in the midst of war. And in an age that boasts of science and technology, what they accomplish here will still depend on the courage and skill of each of them. The ship is two miles from the mouth of the Cochin River two miles from the place her real work begins. Navigation here is dangerous. There is a possibility of running aground on the treacherous shoals and sandbars created by the mud and silt of the river. Added to this danger is the fact that the Viet Cong are entrenched in this area and up until now have roamed the waters almost at will. For the 278 men that comprise this ship, this is the last leg of a long journey. It is a lonely time. San Francisco and Seattle are far behind. The sights and sounds of a once familiar world have given way to the ominous quiet of the nearby jungle shore. leave the ship at dawn and the men fall into the routine that will govern their lives in the months to come. Words like patrol and reconnaissance, words that were once part of their training, here on the river become part of their lives. Far below the unfamiliar stretches from horizon to horizon, Beneath them lies another world, one of uncertainty and danger. The job has begun. Officers, Chan Hutt, report. A war does not depend on ceremony, yet even in this place, a few short guards from Viet Cong territory, there is time for morning quarters. Here on the ship, you get up to Reveille and stand in line to get your food. You live and work with other men in the crowded space of an iron hull, and you adjust to the formalities of shipboard life. But for many, the formalities end when their work begins. Their job is on the river, and for the next 16 hours, their home will be a small, armed, fiberglass boat 
which will carry them far from the safety and comforts of the ship. Their mission is to search, to patrol the waterways and canals of the Delta, to keep the enemy off the river. In the Mekong Delta, the river is the key to the land. To the Vietnamese who live here and use it every day, it is the heart of their existence. It nourishes their crops, provides a route to the marketplace, and sustains their families. These waters are the highways of commerce, and there are over 5,000 miles of natural and man-made canals that wander past cities, villages, and hamlets. But if these waters provide a way of life for the people, they also provide a means of transportation to their enemy. The Viet Cong use the rivers to carry arms, ammunition, and supplies, and to extort taxes from the people. The Viet Cong have used innocent-looking sampans and even children to lure the patrol boats into ambush. And the men have learned from bitter experience that they cannot relax for a moment. A hidden hand grenade, a concealed rifle, these are the hallmark of the enemy and the stamp of guerrilla warfare. Until boats are thoroughly searched, everyone must be suspect. You cannot always tell a Viet Cong by looking or even talking to him. They wear no uniforms, only the black clothes of the peasants. So all boats on the river must be stopped and searched. It's a tedious and dangerous job. 200, 300 sampans are checked every day. You talk with the people, listen to their gossip, and try to get information that may lead to the enemy. It's like a puzzle. A man with an identity card from a too distant province. Or a woman with too large a load of rice for just her family. You may not speak their language very well, but you see things, find clues, and try to put them together. Far from the ports of call, the men labor at the task of keeping a ship fit and her weapons ready. Technology has provided the tools and the training, but men provide the work. 
Equipment must be cared for and maintained. Each hour of patrol means additional hours of tedious, back-breaking work. There is no room for error. In the days that follow, the lives of others will depend on the performance and patience of these men. from the main deck, men pass their rare free time by playing cards, answering a long overdue letter, or reading an outdated magazine. But the vigil continues. A modern naval vessel is more than guns and bullets, steel and black oil. The men aboard her have been trained to perform all the services of a small town. The Navy corpsman is the doctor here, and drugs and medicine are the tools of his profession. But to a people like the Vietnamese, a people who live in the shadow of poverty and disease, medicine and men like the corpsman offer hope for a better life. come 30 miles to the village of Hung Mi on the Cochen River. Most Vietnamese live in a village like this one. A community of 2,000 who work the land, raise livestock, and ply their local trades. But their otherwise simple lives are complicated by disease and infection. The corpsman has set up a clinic in the playground of the local school where patients have already gathered. The soap and rainwater. Yeah. Then you have him spread this on the areas that are itchy, yeah. so that he'll run. Uh, how, uh, how, how many times? How about twice a day? Today, every day, he There are no monuments to what is accomplished here. There is no glory. But in this war, the work done here has become as important as any battle. comes to the Mekong Delta. 
monsoons begin in the east, move westward, and cloak the land in torrential rain. Wind and rain intrude into the life of every man, soaking everything, wearing away at the nerves. Pumps clog, motors fail, ammunition corrodes and guns rust. For days, there is no pause, only the constant sound of rain against metal. But the work of war goes on. The enemy has used the rains to his advantage. Two companies of Viet Cong have been discovered on the shores of the Ba Lai Canal, digging bunkers for an ambush. A plan is made. Patrol boats will transit the canal and act as decoys to force an encounter with the enemy. The ship's helicopters will remain on board, fueled and armed, ready for action. Charlie will expend a little more energy than he has been. So I want you people to be extremely cautious on the rivers. The risks of entering a narrow canal are great. These shallow zones of water are the haven of the Viet Cong. Boats are forced to move slowly, becoming easy targets for enemy fire. Unforeseen circumstances often dictate strategy. Despite all their preparation and planning, the men must turn back. The water has become too shallow. They are forced to find another route. This is Iron Hat 2. Roger out. Bridge, this is radio. Scramble the heroes.
not yet been won. There is no rest now for these men. The enemy has shown himself. They must act quickly, decisively, to deny him his sanctuary. New targets out of reach of the PBRs have been located by the Vietnamese command center. Enemy gun emplacements, bunkers, and supply sampans. Eight, zero, one. I see what's happening. Zero, five.
In this engagement, one of the helicopters was shot down by a sniper in a sampan. This is the price a few will pay in any war, the cost of involvement. And for the remainder of their tour in Vietnam, these men will pay this price time and again. They have faced the enemy. They have endured the ordeal of battle. They have won their badge of courage. A wounded man comes in on a stretcher. Another call to battle. Tracers cutting the stillness of a twilight sky, stabbing at the fleeting shadow of a faceless enemy. The smoke and flame of burning cordite, and the darkness of men at war. The fight will go on. But these sailors, these worn and weary men, have kept the faith.